the way a wetland differs from other bodies of water like lakes or creeks or ponds is that a wetland will go dry at some point throughout the year. It doesn't hold water, you know, the course of a year, like a lake or a pond or something that you think of. And we get calls throughout the summer, you know, folks will come out here and do some early teal scouting or something. They'll say, hey, there's no water in those units. And we're like, well, good. We, we didn't want water in them. You know, we're trying to grow food this time of year. And, and that's why it's dry. And that's, that's what makes them wetlands. Managing wetlands, you know, water is key. And it's key really managing, you know, native grass habitat and, and hardwood stands in that with those types of habitat, you want water, right? We need a rainfall, like last fall's drought was really tough on those different types of habitat. Where in wetlands, we need that water gone. Your upland type habitats, you're hoping for rain usually. And, and, and in these wetlands, we're, we, want it, we want it out of there. And we want it to stay as dry as we can throughout the summer so those plants have as much time to grow and produce as many seeds as possible. So wetland work is a, it's a year round task. And here we are, it's the end of waterfowl season. We're in early February and we've already started preparing for this coming waterfowl season that opens in November. Today we're opening up our screw gates to draw down our wetlands. We're letting the water back out, let it go back into the river so we can promote that moist soil vegetation growing in these units. So right now we're opening this screw gate here at Three Mile Slough at Keystone. And this screw gate was just installed. We've never had the opportunity to uh, manipulate water levels on this slough and it's, it's just over 100 acres of a riverine wetland that we've never been able to get food in. Uh, they used to be able to cut some beaver dams at the end, drain it a little bit and plant some millet, but flood events have caused that to silt up. So this project's been a long time coming, but this summer we were able to put in a 800 foot pipeline that goes from where I'm at down this wheat strip to the Cimarron River. And now we'll be able to drain this get some moist soil vegetation in it and have some food for waterfowl. So this is a, going to be a great, great asset to hunters and waterfowl alike. So we're pretty excited about it. And that moist soil vegetation will act as food for waterfowl flying down through their migration in November and December and January. Uh, not only is it a heavy seed producer, but the fibrous stalks that those plants produce uh, they are great food for invertebrates and a lot of our waterfowl are they're looking for those invertebrates so invertebrates are still in there feeding on those stalks and uh, even last week we came out and did some invertebrate sampling and found a lot of coronamids and some small crustaceans and things like that that waterfowl just absolutely love. Ideally if our drawdown has gone well we have plants growing you know in April and May and we're out in our units looking at dikes do the dikes need repair do they have beaver damage uh, if there's been a flood year the past summer They'll even have grass carp damage where they've been in there chasing roots and they've kind of rooted out a spot much like a pig. We also have pig damage and they can damage the dikes, you know. And we don't want any irregularities on those dikes where when water comes over them and flood events, you know, it'll find kind of a low spot and just eat through your dikes. A lot of times, you know, these wetlands, they're in low lying kind of floodplain areas and it just doesn't dry up through the entire year and, and repairs need to be made. So we, we have to get in there and do it by hand, you know, the old fashioned way with uh, hip boots and a shovel and a five gallon bucket a lot of the times. We're here at another wetland unit and we're drawing down this unit just like we were on the other one. But today we're having to contend with the original wetland manager, uh, the beaver. He's, uh, he's taken exception to our dike and thought he'd uh, remove this wall and get a little bit bigger house. So this summer we'll have to come back once this is dry, uh, put chain link fence along that dike to keep him from digging into it. and. He's also built several dams down along this channel where we drain out of. We about got her going our way, don't we? Beavers are, you know, the original wetland creator. They, they started damming, you know, low-lying creeks and things like that and creating these wetland meadows, you know, and they're great habitat for lots of species. Unfortunately, they're kind of counterproductive in our man-made wetlands where you know, they'll see something maybe that we don't see and they try to dam it up, whether we're, we're drawing down a unit or maybe they're damming up a spillway because that's our low spot where we prevent washing out dikes, you know, and they're like, hey, let me help you out a little bit and, and dam this up, you know, and it's, it's counterproductive from our end so that they're a nuisance, you know, in our man-made wetlands a lot of the times. So our pump is, it's unique to this area. We have to set it in with the track hoe and most of them have a, a stationary pump site where that pump stays in their river or their creek and just they hook up a power unit to it each fall and just flip a switch. And ours, we have to get it out of the river because it wouldn't last through you know, flood events. So 
Uh, just like managing the units, you know, this is very dynamic because we're at the mercy of water levels and river surges. The, the pump is the same way and it's got that concrete box that sits out in the river and it's constantly catching silt uh, even to the point of where silt deposited inside the box and filled it up and it's nine feet tall, you know, by four foot by four foot and filled it up with sand. And we had to scoop, I think, 93 five gallon buckets of sand out of it by hand, you know, just to where we could start pumping water back through that thing. We'll place that pump on top of that concrete box. Then we will back our diesel power unit up to it, hook it up, and then flip a switch, turn a key, and it's pumping water into that pipeline that runs up into our upper five units. And then these lowest units, it just gravity feeds. And it takes about three to three and a half weeks, if they're all dry, to fill them all the way up to max capacity. And that's running the pump 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We'll usually start about mid-October. Mid to late October, we'll try to get that pump placed in. And again, we're at the mercy of the river level because the pier that we take the track hoe and pump out on, it's only got about a foot of freeboard from normal lake level. So if we have a you know, rain in Guthrie or Stillwater, a two inch rain, and it kind of sends a river surge down or the lake's not at normal elevation, we have to wait for it to recede a little bit so we can walk out there and safely set that pump in. So ideally we do that in October and then we'll start pumping and units should be you know, at max capacity by mid, mid-November. So that the wetland habitat, it's, it's unique, you know, because we are putting so much effort into it throughout the year, throughout the growing season, and throughout, you know, late summer, getting that thing pumped up. But we want to have those valuable food resources available throughout the entire length of winter and waterfowl season that as these birds migrate, you know, south, that they find food available instead of, you know, hey, it's all there for opening day, and then they get shot at and they get scattered and then they just disappear and we don't have any food or water left. So that's why it's kind of a year long process that we put in so much time and effort into this thing. And we wanna be here just as ready in December 1st as we are November 1st and January 1st also. So all of our units, you know, they're roughly 18 inches deep, you know, on average, some of them range a little bit deeper, but that, that allows us to attract a lot of dabbling ducks. So mallards and pintails and teal and, uh, gadwalls and widgeon and things like that. Now, the way we look at it is that these units were built with hunters dollars right through the sport fish and wildlife restoration acts so we want to manage it for the hunters who paid for it. Uh, folks you know folks will always question us you know did you plant Japanese millet or why didn't you plant Japanese millet or uh, how come you don't plant Japanese millet and it, Japanese millet's great. It's a great attractant. It's not a great food source. It's kind of like uh, feeding you candy bars. You know, I love it, and I'm not going to pass one up. But it's hard to it's hard to make a three month migration. You know, off candy bars. I tell a lot of folks that kind of dabble in waterfowl hunting, but they're, they're they're mainly deer hunters. I tell them, you know, you wouldn't go out to your property and doze off every oak tree you had to put a corn feeder. You know, you've already got the food source there, you've got a much better food source, and that's essentially what we'd do if all we wanted to do was plant Japanese millet in here. We'd be wiping out all these great foods with all this great, you know, carbohydrates and amino acids and things like that in those plants to plant, you know, a, a Milky Way. We start in February, drawing these units down and trying to grow the best food for them and then working on pumps and working on dikes, working on screw gates and, and praying that we don't get a flood that wipes it all out. And then we put the pump in and then the water starts coming, we're flooding food. And then November starts to hit and these birds start to show up. And it's just, it's gratification, but it's so much relief. Like we finally, we made it, we made it to migration. We made it to waterfowl season and the hunters can enjoy, you know, three months of waterfowl season out here. It doesn't matter, you know, what type of habitat you're managing, whether it's wetlands or uplands, you know, there's always difficulties. And, and we struggle with, a lot of times it's too much water here and our folks out west, they're struggling with not enough water. You know, a lot of times they're thinking, hey, we can't pump these units. But where and when we can manage these types of habitat for wildlife and for sportsmen, I think it's our responsibility to do so and to do so in the best way that we can.